Episode 2! Well, hi, and welcome back. Very, very glad that you're still listening. Can't believe it. In this episode, I'm actually really excited about this one. Uh, we've got a bit of a campaign going. Really, really like you to get involved as well, if you can. It's called Medcoms is for me. So we've got a hashtag, hashtag Medcoms is for me. And this is all about encouraging people from all walks of life to consider Medcoms as a career option. So I think STEM, so science, technology, engineering and maths, and of course medicine, medical science and medical communications does fit inside this bracket, sometimes has been associated with issues whereby certain groups of people can be relatively lacking. And this, of course, is a very sad situation, and there have been efforts to improve this. One example of a great project that has been tackling diversity within STEM is this fantastic initiative called Soapbox Science. This has actually been going for uh, just about 10 years now. So I'm going to start actually with an interview with the founders of this project. This is Dr. Natalie Petaroli and Professor Siren Sumner. And what they've been doing uh, in Soapbox Science is they've been challenging the stereotypes of what a scientist is and introducing the world to more women and non-binary people from the sector. So this was a project based at the Zoological Society of London and aims to bring science to the streets so that as many people as possible can meet and learn from their local researchers. So it literally did start out as this this initiative where they actually got, they literally got people to come out on the streets uh, and chat about it, hence the name Soapbox Science. It's now in pretty much every university uh, that you would care to visit. It was a massive project, um, and it's happened in 59 cities now, in 14 countries, reaching nearly a quarter of a million people. So this is massive progress, and they've done a fantastic job. Kicked off in 2011, so as I said, uh, about 10 years now that this has been going, which is which is just amazing. So I'm going to kick off with an interview from, uh, from, from these two. We're then going to turn to one of our very own principal medical writers, Dr. Laura Law. Really, really pleased to uh, chat to her on this episode as well. I'm going to be talking about how she came uh, to be in medical communications and I'll also maybe I'll bore you with my own backstory as well, shall I? I don't know. Maybe I'll let you off with that one. And now, as always, uh, because this is going to be a bit of a recurring thing and, and I hope that's evident by now, but I am going to be asking all guests to provide their suggestions, nay, their orders for your playlist, because that's right. It is my mission to make sure that you have just a killer playlist to listen to when you return to work after uh, finishing listening up here, of course. Of course. And I'll be popping in a mystery guest at the end as well. Well, that's enough chat from me for now. Let's kick off. And as I said, we're going to start with this interview with Dr. Natalie Petaroli and Professor Siren Sumner. Absolute pleasure to have you on the uh, on this episode with us, ladies. Thank you so much. My name is Natalie Petrelli. I'm a scientist at the Zoological Society of London. And uh, my name is Serian Sumner, and I'm a professor of behavioural ecology at UCL. Oh, Serian and Natalie, thank you so much. Uh, very, very warm welcome to the show. Uh, absolutely fantastic uh, platform we're we'll talking about today. And uh, yeah, 10 years on, this is, of course, for Soapbox Science. And I, I just say to start with, I just think this this movement has been so brilliant because I'm I'm pretty sure every single university you go to now this is always so so pressed isn't it that you know women and non-binary people and indeed everybody need to get up and talk about science to the public and get everybody excited about science and that's really a movement that that started with soapbox science so I just think it's this this brilliant movement so you know it'd be great just to get you both to kind of reflect a bit on this 10 years on yeah well so we, we we've been thinking about this one of the things that is worth saying is that when we started people didn't systematically think it was a brilliant idea <laughs> i remember vividly when we started people telling me things such as yeah it would be great but but actually it would be better if you also put men on soapboxes, not just women <laughs> so it's quite nice to have gone 
gone from 10 years on where it was a struggle just to explain yes. that we needed a platform to ch showcase diversity, to talk about diversity in science, to provide role models, to show that scientists come in all shape, form, color, whatever you think, to now where we're starting to say, well, actually, there's a lot of people that, that, that see the value of this and that have engaged with it. And I mean, they have engaged, you know, we're talking 14 countries, 59 cities. So it's, it's really reached out and we hope it reach even wider but um resonate with a lot of people yeah that's absolutely fantastic and i i, I guess it comes back to you know the, the absolute essential requirement to to encourage you know young girls and all people to to actually think about you know stem as career pathways because you know i just think it's very sad to think that actually you know historically it might have been the case that actually people were discouraged from going down those career paths just because they might not see representation and think, well, it's not for me. Yeah, exactly. I think there's the whole one of the things that we, we hope that uh, Soapbox does is it provides those role models. So even if you're not particularly encouraged to do science as a child um, by your family or by your particular school or, or you know your teachers, if you happen to see female scientists um, and, and understand what they're doing and, and see it as a normal thing that women do, I think we think that it's much more likely that a child, a, a girl might even might think that could be me one day. I quite fancy that. Wow, I'd like to be like her. Yes. So it's all about providing role models that are accessible. Not only to the kids, but also the one that come to science to show them it's possible to have a career, it's possible to stay. It's it's a community, a good community to build a career. Because uh, what we have as a problem too, at least in in um, science such as biology, is that women do go for a science job in biology, but they don't stay. And, and sometimes that has also to do with a role model. Just you know, someone showing you that it's possible to have a family, it's possible to be happy, it's possible to to have a good, um, fulfilling career career in science and um, i think our, our soapbox science events they often the speakers or the the organizers have got their families with them anyway so as well as seeing the scientists they often you know they'll also see that the scientists have got their kids with them yes, we've had yes. some scientists give their talks with like their baby on their hips and <laughs> standing yes. on a soapbox with the baby that's brilliant <laughs> well, thank you so much, Beth. I'd love, as, if it's okay with you, as I was thinking about, um, you know, helping out, potentially helping out, you know, especially let, let's say there's, you know, some parents at home listening in and they're thinking, oh, you know, my, my, my daughter might be really interested in, in hearing a bit more about this. I wonder if you've got any kind of handy resources that we can point people towards. This might not be a question, obviously, that you can answer off the top of your head, but if there is anything that you, you know, could point us towards, that, that would be amazing. Oh, yeah, no, I think I think I would really recommend to, uh, to visit our Subbox Science uh, website because in there you find link to all our speakers and little uh, chat on YouTube that they have done to present different science network. You also also find information about where are the next where are the next events and which one might be close to you um, and then it provides you with a lot of different uh, there's a blog with a lot of uh, um, uh, discussion and thinking about career um, building in science and what was the hurdle there's a lot of tips so I, I think I think that this would work well as a, as a first portal to think about a career in science or to look for uh, events and, uh, and try to get inspired that way do join us on social media because we we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, we are on YouTube, any kind of uh, uh, social media you can think of, we're probably there. And it's always Subbox Science. And I think that's, that's a cool community to join and to follow up on, on what we're doing. <laughs> Well, thank you very much again to Dr. Natalie Petteroli and Professor Siren Sumner for coming on the podcast to talk all about their mission to challenge those stereotypes of what a scientist is uh, with that fantastic initiative, Soapbox Science. Don't forget to check that out across socials. And of course, returning to our kind of main topic, Medcoms, because of course we are a medical communications agency. That's super, super relevant for us. So I think the, the kind of key message really to take away is that is Medcoms for me? Yes, it is. If you want it to be, it's there for you. Consider it as your career option and stay in it. If you're already in there uh, and you're enjoying it, don't leave. Don't leave. Stay, uh, progress. It's fantastic. All right. 
Now, next up, as promised, uh, we're going to be talking to our very own principal uh, medical writer, Dr. Laura Law. We're going to be covering um, kind of her backstory, how she got into medical communications. Uh, hopefully it might resonate with some of you out there, or indeed if, you, if you're if you not a medical writer yourself, but you've been considering this, this might you know help to kind of inspire you uh, and make you kind of think about making that jump yourself. Before we turn to uh, to Laura, though, I think it's time we did do one thing. It was promised, and you're probably thinking, where is it, Ben? You promised this. I know, it's the song suggestions for your playlist. I, I haven't forgotten this coming up right now. Let's see what Dr. Petteroli and Professor Sumner are going to add to it, shall we? Here goes. <laughs> And uh, as for the uh, song choice, I'll go with Johnny Be Good by oh, John nice. Perry. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, perfect. And Syrian, what about yourself? Um, yeah, so it's so funny that Natalie chose Johnny Be Good because I was thinking, what song can I choose? And I, I have a confession. So <laughs> I, um, I, and I, and it's timely because this happened at the weekend. I play the the keyboard in our village band oh yes uh, so I'm giving a shout out to our village band it's called the stud muffins it's a dreadful name but it's been it's been like it's existed for decades and and uh, and we did a we actually did play johnny be good on saturday um but i was going to choose a slightly more unusual song um which is called home by edward sharp and the magnetic zeros and oh, yes. it's kind of musically very interesting which is why i chose it oh fantastic well thank you very much both I think people are not only going to be searching for Soapbox Science, but they're going to be checking out that band now, Stud Muffins. They're going to be Googling it. Oh, so no, I don't get think you can find us online. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we're, we're just a bunch of rather oh. unskilled people. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Um, well, thank you so much both for your time. We really appreciate it. And of course, I really urge our listeners to go ahead and check out Soapbox Science across all of the platforms. And uh, thank you for thank you for your time today, both. Really, really absolute pleasure to have you on the show with us. On top of your song choices, might have to actually end up playing the Indiana Jones theme tune as well now, because you know, uh, I've heard it mentioned a couple of times. <laughs> what do you think? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> couple of storming choices there for your playlist make sure you go away and download those right away uh, i know what you're gonna be doing you're gonna be going away and trying to find professor sumner's band aren't you i can sense it okay it's that time it's time to turn to our next uh, very very special guest it's our very own principal medical writer dr laura law we're gonna start by asking her how she got into medcoms here was what she had to say. My story was that I was probably just coming to the end of the second year of my PhD and one of my friends who was a little bit further on, along the road to me said, oh, hey, there's this uh, post-grad careers event coming up next week. Um, you know, w- would you like to come with me? And I just kind of I remember thinking, well, you know, career, you know, surely we're, we all just go and we do our, we finish our PhD and then we move into to doing a postdoc. And I just hadn't thought that far ahead or really just considered, you know, what I could possibly do as a job. Uh, so I went to this um, careers affair and what was really funny about it was my friend, she talked to lots of people on lots of different stands and became, came away convinced, no, I want to stay in academia. I want to carry on with my research. Whereas I kind of had the opposite. I um I think basically was was going along the tables looking for for free free swag and uh, got to, to one um, table that just happened to be talking about medical writing and they said to me, oh you know have you heard of medical writing? And I said no, you know <laughs> I had not I had no idea what this was all about. And we had a discussion and the more we talked about it, the more I realised that um it was really aligned to kind of the, the things that I enjoyed doing during my PhD, which was you know, when the experiments were done, being able to collect the data, uh, put it into a format that told a story. That was the bit that kind of interested me the most. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting you say that. I, I think it's um, it's very much one of those skills, I think, that people probably have without really, really realising it. You know, when they're, do- for example, if they're doing a PhD and, and they actually find, you know, what I'm really enjoying the kind of writing upside. You, you might get some people who hate that kind of stuff. But then if you're the kind of person who likes that, maybe that should be something to think you know, ah, actually, that's a that's a skill that can lead to to a, a proper career path. So so nurture it. Yes, exactly. So I uh, 
I didn't realize I think how much um, worries about my future in, in, in academia were weighing me down until I had those discussions at the fair and I actually came away feeling really positive for you know properly for the first time in weeks. The way that I can kind of describe it it was a bit like I was on a travelator at an airport and I, it was just pushing me towards something and I didn't even consider stepping off it and looking elsewhere and to realize that I could just take the parts that I enjoyed the most and 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 do you know do them was was, um, was a revelation so that made me feel real really hopeful for kind of my and my next steps after I finished my PhD and yeah I think you're absolutely right that a lot of um, people who are you know in the thick of it with their with academic research they could be really enjoying it but then they are um, really immersed in their own work and I think when you're especially if you're working in something like I was in um, you know, immunology where you're looking at things in you know almost like microscopic detail people they forget to kind of like step back and look at the bigger picture like where does my research fit in what why should it matter to other people you know why is it important and those kinds of things and I think it'd be hard to see the big picture when you're you know, you know looking for a flow cytometer and <laughs> looking at like everything like at a cellular level yeah that's awesome I mean I think a kind of recurring kind of theme throughout uh, what you're kind of saying and I think this does come on to the my next question which was gonna you know focus down on what you really love and enjoy in medcoms and actually uh, you're, you're kind of touching on that already with you know it, it kind of seems to me like what you absolutely love is just telling a story with the data taking something that's potentially extremely complicated and you know potentially very confusing and actually coming up with something interesting and uh, and relevant to people to actually listen to and understand every hour of the day we're bombarded with messages whether it's through advertising or um you know say say in the case of um of a doctor you know they might be reading a lot of papers they see you know they're very busy people you know bombarded with emails your job is to cut through that noise you need to make it as easy as possible for them to pull the thread of your story and to jump in and actually care about what you have what you have to say to them and and that's kind of the thing that we you know I think is you know medical in medcoms we sort of have to help our clients with because they are coming into it and thinking right we need we want this to happen we want whether it's like they want to increase awareness of a particular you know disease or whether they they're launching a new drug and it's going to be positioned as this new treatment option and maybe it has some advantages over the existing treatments on the market but they um, they're often coming to the table with assumptions of what their target audience is thinking and feeling and, and where they're currently at in that journey. And I think what we need to do as writers is obviously figure out where the target audience is actually at and kind of meet them there. It's almost like we're kind of the bridge between the um, the client and the target audience. So we need to sort of take almost what the, the client is offering and pass it on to the target audience. It is a really interesting role because of that, because you're almost like the conduit between the two different worlds. Yeah, thank you, Laura. That's fantastic. I think it's a really nice um... Uh, a really nice way for people to kind of think about, you know, who, what our role, role is was all about, really. So th thank you for that. Um, I won't um, force you to answer too many more questions. I just think a, a nice one to finish on. I don't know if you kind of want to do this one. It, we don't have to. But I just thought it might be nice if you did have any kind of words off the top of your head. Uh, just for anyone out there thinking about perhaps getting into medcoms, this might be someone... I don't know who, who's perhaps still doing their PhD or, or, or perhaps doing their master's or whatever uh, and looking out there and thinking, oh, this medcom sounds interesting. Um, or, or indeed, they might they might be doing their A-level still. I just wondered if you had any words of, of, of advice or, or just any words to, for, you know, for those people to take on board. Doesn't matter if you don't. Just thought it might be quite nice if you did off the top of your head. Yeah, I'll try and think of something good now. But um, I know that when I was, uh, you know, it university but you know both when I did my master's and my PhD I wondered what possibly could I offer to um, you know in a career and, and when you're young you know as well you feel like you know what what perspective can I possibly bring but the more that I of myself that I've brought to my role the more successful I've been and the easier I found uh, writing and reviewing for other people and or going on client calls or helping to support younger team members. I think it was in, in Aladdin where the genie said, you know, be yourself. And I think that <laughs> it's so it's it's so corny but and cliche, but it is true. I think just um, recognise the, the things that you enjoy and find a way to um, to bring those into your future 
role know yourself and know your strengths because I guess I, I for me I hadn't really considered um, my strengths in writing and how I can y use those skills I kind of just blindly went along with what what I thought I was good at but I think it's just um trying to take clues about what you enjoy so you know so, so think about maybe your favorite subject at uni you know um why did you what did you enjoy about that subject and is there anything in the working world that you can um, anywhere in the working world that you can find that and and kind of do that because you will um you'll do so much better when you're working within your what I call your zone of genius the things that you find most natural and kind of um your your strengths and just play to those strengths yeah, thank you, Laura. I think that's that's some that's some lovely words to to finish on. So thank you for that. And and I'm afraid it's time for the uh, for the evil question. I, I did this for Carl as well because the, it's quite harsh when there's absolutely no warning. But it's time, right? Are you ready for this? Time to <laughs> recommend a song for the playlist today. <laughs> it's harsh, I know, without, without any warning. But oh my have gosh. you got have okay. you got a favourite tune that you think people should go away after listening to this? And they should just get it straight on their playlist. Maybe. OK, so uh, I recommend Let It Go from Frozen. It's all about um, sort of recognising what's inside of you and just letting it out, whether that's a big ball of ice or, <laughs> or, or a unusually natural writing style. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Thank you, Laura. I'm very impressed with the, the kind of link there as well. It's actually something kind of relevant. So I'm, I'm impressed with that. Okay. <laughs> Let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, that's another fantastic song choice, isn't it? Add that to your playlist. I mean, I don't think we even need to ask you. It's probably already in there, isn't it? Anyway, Laura, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, podcast to share your kind of backstory uh, and what you enjoy uh, about medical communication. So I really do hope that resonates with some of you out there. Uh, uh, you know, even if you're a student and that was some great advice from Laura there about just looking in your studies, finding out what you enjoy. And if writing is one of those things that you're really enjoying, look for some uh, workplaces that will actually allow you to explore that further, develop it, and crucially, build yourself a fantastic career out of it. So thanks, Laura. Uh, fantastic to have you. Make sure you have a look for Laura on uh, LinkedIn. So to search for Laura Law, she's got some, uh, uh, well, a very strong LinkedIn game, should we say. She posts some great stuff, so uh, do check her out. Thank you, Laura. Uh, okay, we're going to come towards the end of uh, this episode. Can't quite believe that already. It's come around quickly, hasn't it? Uh, but as promised, I'm going to I'm going to leave you with a bit of a mystery guest now. And actually, I, I won't add it to this podcast because it's already available online. This was done for some of my uh, uh, radio stuff on uh, Coast FM. But we've actually got an interview with the uh, producer and the director of. Are you ready? Frozen Two. How very relevant for Laura's song choice. Go and check it out. We might drop the link on our, on our socials if, if, if you like. So you can check that out there. Um, but just search for it. If not, it's on YouTube. Uh, anyway, that's, that's it from me. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, we're going to aim to make these, uh, you know, just about 20 minutes each episode. Uh, you know, nice and nice and sweet. Not too long. So do make sure you watch out for episode three that will be coming soon. But for now, it's goodbye. And I do hope that this episode has helped make you realize that medcoms is for you please use our hashtag hashtag medcoms is for me and let's spread the word bye for now <laughs>